group of staff sergeants and sergeant majors took over the country. And then they began to do the same bad things. And I said to myself, people should speak up on this, you know. But Sai, you speak up now. Uh, you might be in trouble. So I kept quiet. And then one day, you are driving on the streets of Liberia, somebody stops you and says, give me the key of that message. You quickly give it to him and come out and say, thank God it's just the message, so and not my life. Then you get to him and you say to your wife, ah, darling, hey, thank God I'm alive, oh. but they've taken the message. And then in the night, you're sleeping, we are boo 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 on your door, you say, ah, pack out, pack out, commandant, he won't use his house. You see, in the end, you finish up in a refugee camp, one arm chopped off, saying, thank God I'm still alive, looking for food. So in many ways, Nigeria is slowly moving towards that. So it is in the self-interest of the fortunate elite to change this trajectory. If the poor are hungry, someone said in Nigeria, and they cannot sleep. <laughs> the rich cannot sleep with two eyes closed because they may eat the rich for dinner. Uh, in many ways, these problems are such that uh, the urgency of now is for the middle class, the elite, to understand that they have to play a vanguard role in reengineering Nigeria. Otherwise, the only option is that we run out, as many of you are in the diaspora, or we become like the guys in Somalia, God forbid. But that is what is beckoning at us. And so it's not about teaching the poor values. It's about our learning the values to make us act in a way that will create a society. It's like, you know what? I, one of the things I in spite of everything like this country, United States of America, is the opportunities are enough to keep the poor from being so hungry that they want to eat the, the rich. Rich are getting richer and richer, but the poor is wondering, what the hell, you can have any private number of private jets you want. I have my two, uh, my my house, my small house, family is good, goes to school, blah, blah, blah. I don't care. Now, it's only smart thinking that leads you to creating a society that at the very least provides the opportunities that nobody is so hungry that he eats the other. Now, let me just turn to uh, uh, Biodun uh, and the points made about uh, common good and values, tribe, the use of the term tribe. I, I it took some thinking before I Settle for the idea of tribe in, in naming what we're doing. I mean, I have traditionally talked about um, the hierarchy in Greek society. You know, in Greek society, those who think only about themselves are usually thought of as idiots. Then people move up in life, they think about much more than themselves. They think about people they have certain affinity, affiliation with either by blood, language, religion, whatever it is that the group is. And that group is a tribe. Typically, tribesmen see everybody outside of their tribe as an enemy. And so tribal societies are constantly at war. Well, when man begins to mature more and see universal solidarity in other people and see things like the common good, they then become citizens. And part of the challenge of our society is that many of us have failed to become citizens and some who try to become have even under the pressure from selfish politicians fallen back into the tribe or gone further down to become idiots. I believe that this vanguard that needs to be created to then continue to expand like a, 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 an oasis that then begins to uh, uh, um, 
expand and link up with other oases and then becomes a lake and then hopefully an ocean, including everybody, is what we need. And that it needs to have the fierceness of the tribe against people who are not of that tribe. Uh, but the good thing about this tribe is that it's a tribe of values, universal values. It's a tribe that says that we are no tribe and tongue may differ in brotherhood, we stand. It is a tribe that believes in merit, the tribe that opposes the work ethic. Uh, that tribe is needed to spur the new Nigeria. Others will see them, love them, and join them. Very importantly, the world will see that tribe and say, okay, there are people we can deal with in Nigeria. I mean, the trust level for Nigeria and the world is very, very low. And yet, we produce 70% of the doctors of color in America. We are perhaps now the uh, most wealthy nationality group in North America uh, uh, and, and all of that. So it shows that the capacity to be top performers is in us. But somehow, the views of leaders, of emotions in Nigeria prevents us from holding together and working well. So it is important to create this tribe that will prevent them from using divide and rule, divide and conquer. Um, you know, about the idea of um, uh, 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 whether we should move around names of states or whatever, I think that, the, you know, under the military, well, the practice, which I think has some merit, but it's not easy in a civilian arrangement. You can't, you can't put that in the Constitution easily. The military used to appoint people from other states as governors. I mean, uh, Ukiwe uh, was governor of Lagos. Um, Admiral Ndubisikan um, was governor of Lagos. Uh, Buba Marwa was governor of Lagos. Vice versa. So where people posted around to states that were not their states. Uh, perhaps there is some merit in it in making people realize that we are all the same. Even universities. There was a time Vice Chancellors were deliberately taking from other parts of the country. Today, you need us. They are now fighting that the Vice Chancellor must come from or your state. In uh, uh, UNN, uh, has to come from one village in Osaka. All kinds of silly things that are now defining even academia in Nigeria. Um, and so, if we had a culture, a culture that is very merit driven, I mean, nobody will ask what state does this VC come from. They will ask, is he the most capable, the most qualified person to be vice chancellor? of this university. Uh, but the next and very uh, uh, important and somehow nuanced issue of conversation that came out of uh, uh is the business of indigenship. I mean, those of you who live in America here know that if you ask an American what's his state of origin, he will think you are crazy. <laughs> you know, you move to a state and pay tax there for two years, that becomes your state. Okay. And, the, the Bushes, the Bushes, uh, uh, there was a time, I think two or three of them were like governors in different states, okay. one in Texas, one in Florida. Okay. And they started out from, uh, their father started yeah. out from uh, Boston area. Yeah. Uh, can you talk about Maine? Yeah. So, I don't know why somebody would live all his life. He was born in Joss. He's... 78 years old. He has paid taxes all his life in Joss. And you wake up one day and say, ah, look, my friend, you are not a plateau person. It's going to take obviously political will and good leadership to change those kinds of elements of culture. But it is important to get to those things. Um, look, as a nine-year-old, my first language was Hausa. As a nine-year-old, 
my first, very first language. I mean, I, I didn't speak my native tongue, as they say in Nigeria. And I could travel, and I did travel from Guzo to Onisha, unaccompanied, as a nine-year-old. And you could go up to an older person and say, what should I do? Change training. Kaduna, get to Enugu, change to a bus, get to Anisha, take the entrance exam, and head all the way back to Guzo with no problem. Today, a 24-year-old man is going to do his call in Abuja from Lagos. His mother will accompany him. And that's what has happened in our country, and we need to change those things. All right. Thank you very much, sir. So uh, let's just move to Shiju and Femi. Femi, if you are there, Shiju, if you are there, let's make it fast so that we can go to solutions proper. And Dr. Radi is waiting. So maybe we should just take the three of you together because you are the last three. So let's start with Femi, then Shiju, then Dr. Radi. Femi, are you there? Shiju, are you there? Okay, Fabi said I should read this question. He has already sent it to me. Okay. Mm -hmm. So what we'll do is uh, I'll let Dr. Ariadi ask his question. Then we'll move to schedule. Then I'll, I'll read out Fabi's question. Dr. Ariadi, you have the floor, sir. Yeah, thank you very much, Ariadi. Uh, 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 my mind is more of an observation. And I wanted to find out what props um understanding of this situation is there's very scant proof, but what really bothers me is this talk about external influences, particularly in the arena of leadership selection in Africa. That appears to be a major issue. Um, what we have seen over the last 20, 25 years is aspiring leaders of Nigeria would anchor on to some foreign power. And when the, when the, the, the process unfolds, you see their hands. And the effect of that is that the interest or the votes of the common man does not count. That to me, that's my mind, is a major issue. We have our internal problems. Yeah, the weaponized poverty and, um, you know, democracy cannot be perfect in, a, in, a, in, a, in an entire, in its entirety, when it's, when it's kind of subdued, the human in our people, the human sense of self amongst our people that is an internal issue that we could begin to dis to discuss but what is your opinion about the influence of foreign powers in a leadership selection process if we do not manage that i guess whatever other efforts we're putting into that process may not work my, I, I see leadership in Nigeria in the mode of, yeah, like you put it, everybody's just looking for a way to survive beyond office. They want to acc accumulate as much as they can so that future generations do not suffer what they think they have suffered when they were growing up and things like that. This uncertainty about life after service, that has put a lot of pressure on some of these leaders. But... If we can, now like Dr. Uh, Ibe, I think it was Dr. Ibe who said, who, you know, gave um, an analogy of, okay, the where somebody's drowning and you're talking, you're telling him about values, he may not catch fire, he may not, you know, he, he may not understand what you're talking about. That is a major issue. The average Nigerian, from my experience in the political marketplace, is that what, the, what, what drives the average Nigerian 
is to accumulate wealth, money, power. It's just to oppress other citizens, to have to operate from a higher pedestal and be seen as a demi as as a demigod. That goes to a very, very deep level in our culture. We have discussed culture today. Now, where the average Nigerian appears to have lost the capacity for critical thinking, and we're talking about democracy, the power to exercise the choice of selecting a leader depends heavily on the capacity to think. Mm. I am an unofficial obedient. And the only reason I went for that choice was because Obi demonstrated a deep understanding of the need to build the person. When people have been given the power to make the right choices wherever they are, it's easier to galvanize them and drive them in the right direction. Unfortunately, that is not happening in our country. I think that is something we have to focus on. The first thing is now, how do we eliminate foreign influence in our leadership selection process? And two, how do we empower the man at the grassroots who is going to cast their vote to be able to think critically beyond all other influences, primordial sentiments, monetary inducements? They put everything aside and say, hey, I should see beyond this, this election. If I make a wrong choice, I will face the consequences of such wrong choice. Now, those will be the areas I think we must primarily focus. How can we empower the average voter? And I, I, I'm ready to run with any brilliant. This idea of having this new tribe is brilliant, but I still don't see the nexus to have to be able to influence the critical mass of Nigerians to make the right decisions when the time comes. Because elections still, you know, as much as we say democracy is good and it's the best uh, process to select your lead, the, your leaders, it still boils down to the capacity of the average voter to make the right choices. And right, you could say, is relative. What is right to me may not be right to you. But if that man who has the franchise only cannot see beyond tribe, cannot see beyond immediate hunger, how do we make that move? How do we make that shift? Let me stop there for now. Okay. So. Uh, thank you very much, Doc. Uh, so let me just tell Prof what Femi's question is. Uh, he wants to know because there's a lot of confusion in the diaspora too. People really don't know what they are trying to do. Some people mean well, but there's always argument here and there. So he wants to know how there can be diaspora collaboration. And his reasons are not perfect. You've, you've spoken so much about Asia, India as a focal point. You've, tra you've traversed the Asian you know, countries, Malaysia, Indonesia, and all that. So you always say that, look, these guys have done it, we can do it. Do it. That is their diaspora. So what exactly is expected from the Nigerian diaspora contingent, specifically America, North America, Canada, North America, that's why. Uh, Dr. Shiju is in UK, you know, it's election time. She's a member of the conservative, so they are moving around out. <laughs> so, so those are the two questions. That's why we end up. When you finish that, we can now, you can now summarize on the solution way forward, then we'll give you a vote of thanks. Okay. Well, thanks. Uh, uh, let me begin with um, the question about uh, foreign influence. Um, first of all, the whole idea of international relations is about the maximization of power in the arena. So every country tries to position itself to up its own benefits in the relationship with, with others. Uh, and um, it should not be a surprise that powerful nations try very hard to 
exert some influence to be sure that people sympathetic to their interests are in power in less powerful countries so that they support them in different ways, vote for them at the UN, and this and this and this and that. But it is our duty to say to them and say to ourselves that what is the most important is our self-interest and that we, you know, do not accept that they interfere in our internal affairs. They will try. Believe me, they will try. Uh, but if they see that we have an elite that is challenging them, if I'm just talking about the fact that they're trying to inter intervene, interfere, they will back off because they don't want to be seen to do it, even though they are, they would like to do it. And we have a, a remarkable and interesting example of Senegal right now. You know, one of the uh, narratives that our politicians use to uh, fence out good people who want to run for offices are, ah, you know, that man is just an intellectual. He has no experience. And what we call experience is what has kept us where we are. In fact, we should abolish experience if, if what we have is what experience can get you. We should make sure that nobody who runs for office has experience. But you see, a young man who has never held public office makes a claim for a new Senegal and captures the imagination of the people. And the incumbent tries to do everything, delay the election, do, but the people put pressure. And they go to the polls and he wins. Now, why can Nigeria not do what Senegal did? Of course, there are different ethnic groups in Senegal. They can all go into this tribal war thing that uh, we say is the divide and rule that. So we need a group that can capture the imagination of people like this tribe in such a way that sensitivity to the damage of the quote-unquote experienced people of yesterday is uh, 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 turned on his head for the citizenry. In a new narrative that says, but the problem is experience. All these people are experiencing is in sharing money. We want new thinking. And so it's still left to us, no matter what happens. It's not about the foreign past, it's about us and how we deal with them uh, really. If we mobilize powerfully and this is why I keep giving the example of um, countries uh, that the diaspora have played a noted role in liberating. They live in countries where they experience certain things. They see it and their own is not going that way. Do you know that if diaspora groups here, you know, let's say the Oyo in diaspora get together and say, look, we're tired of these kinds of people that go into the assembly. Let's forget governor now, state assembly. Because the state governors get away with murder because the people, are, look, as a friend of mine, I, I can't mention, it's not, who is very powerful now in Nigeria. When he was at the lower level of government, one day he just said, ah, now that's the common a joke that uh, Kyle Defy and I have between us. Um, send my, my T boy go to the State House of Assembly. His T boy. And because he said, put him there, his T boy became a member of the State House of Assembly. When the T boy is completely literate, doesn't even know what is going on in the world, they say they should vote. The T boy will call him, Papa, Papa, in cash. Baba will tell him what to do, he will vote. And so if the Oyo diaspora say we must ensure that the house is populated by retired generals, retired vice chancellors, retired 
farmland secretaries, those are the only kind of candidates who will accept. And you don't even wait for them to say they're interested because they will say that they're interested because they don't want the rougher of fights that goes with the business. You send a delegation, and uh, uh, Professor Femi Bamiro, come, 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 we want you to go to the state house. We beg you to do this for us as uh, you get a number of such people. Governor won't mess about. Most of those people were probably his teachers, were his bosses, were his parents, colleagues. He's going to be very respectful and behave properly as governor. But when you get all these fellows, so um, I believe that it is with us, not with the foreign uh, uh, powers that are looking to put. If I, it's their interest to get the worst of us. I mean, you heard the, of the concept of a kakistocracy ruled by the very worst. Very, you know, and, and, and that's the interest of the foreign power. They don't care whether Nigeria does well. Get the worst of them and let, let them vote for us at, at the UN. Anytime we say vote. Uh, so we have to acknowledge that that's the reality and work to prevent it from becoming our lot. Now, what are the things that can um, ensure that we get the right kinds of people to be the ones who seek public office? Besides going to find them and essentially uh, encourage them and plead with them to say, look, don't spend, you don't, you don't have to spend money to become a governor. We know that you can govern this state in the best interest of all. We will raise money. We just want you to show commitment to do this. And then to put pressure on the system to reduce the cost of governance and the cost of running for public office. Make laws that you cannot spend more than so much money that it is based on the people's assessment in their communities and all of that that will choose who will lead this our state. Now, once you ensure that the cost of getting there is low and that you have made an effort to get the right kinds of people to contest against one another for that uh, position, and then you increase the prestige. You know, one of the problems of politics in Nigeria, why politics is so attractive to miscreants, is that the centers of prestige in Nigeria have vanished. Seems like the only center of prestige as worth anything is being a political uh, actor. In Nigeria, most events are not thought to have happened unless the governor or distinguished senator or somebody came to flag it up. So you have all these people running from one event to the other and not governing. They have no time to govern. But if we, like in India, the prestige of the MP is balanced by the prestige of the PAMSEC and by the prestige of the general. And so him there, so many centers of prestige and the man who is general doesn't care about the, being a politician because the prestige of being a general sometimes is much higher than that of being an MP. Then you, you know, have people who go into public life spending very little money and who do not feel that they are the only game in town so the, the snobbery of power is reduced. Uh, I, I always tell the story of my early years, I used to travel quite a bit to Nairobi in Kenya back in the in the eighties. I had a good friend who was who's passed on now, was a famous Kenyan mathematician and journalist, published a newspaper. I used to write a column in music magazine uh, back in those days, my turn. And uh, we would sit in the Thorn Tree Cafe of the uh, New Stanley Hotel in Nairobi. MPs will come in, ah, they will greet him, and, uh, you know, we'll see to drink a cup of tea, this, this, this. He, 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 he saw that Kenyan MPs did not see themselves as some potentate, as Nigerian MPs see themselves, you know. Uh, um, and then, uh, 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 very importantly, 
one thing to do to neutralize this politics of uh, uh, the big man is what South Korea did. Oh. South Korea used to have money bag politics oh. until the South Korea Electoral Commission. And this is why the tragedy of having people like uh, uh, Yakubu really comes home. Electoral Commission in South Korea decided that the path to elections is the debate. So if you're running for office in South Korea, you must go through so many debates in the classrooms, in the gyms, in the on TV. By the time you've done five, six, seven debates, you are forced to discipline yourself to find the issues. And the people know what to hold you accountable for because of what you promised during the debates. In Nigeria, most of the major candidates don't even bother to debate anybody. So we need to use debates to uh, bring the arena down to serious-minded people. And then the question from Femi, the last question is about uh, how, how can diaspora make impact? I've already spoken to that in the manner of speaking. Uh, a diaspora can choose to do a culture offensive. Uh, we, we, we used to have an agency in Nigeria that's supposed to be a national orientation agency. From what we have learned here, diaspora can run a campaign of national orientation, buy space on TV, on this thing, and run a campaign of, just the way we did it in the concerned professionals, by the way, in the 80s. We bought, actually, sorry, in the 90s, we bought three, you know, three times a week or so. We bought full pages in the Guardian, two or three major newspapers, and described the Nigeria we want, the values that Nigeria requires, the way Nigeria should be run. We ran that. Because it costs some money, but giving how much uh, a dollar is to the dollar, to the Naira, I mean, a few people commit to doing uh, $20 a month. You have a big pool of money that you can use to run such campaigns and uh, uh, perhaps reorient the country. Uh, when we did the concerned professionals, I mean, I relied on, on my friends. Okay? I was uh, teaching there at the Lagos Business School, and many of the students were executives. I would just whisper to them, and, you know, they will send some money. I mean, my favorite generous person was Erastus Akimbola. Those were the early days of Intercontinental Bank. Erastus would just send somebody with a briefcase to me and there will be 500,000 Naira in it. I'm talking about 1993, 94. So that's how we paid for those adverts. Yeah, people like Erastus, people like uh, Biodun Daviri uh, 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 and co. Uh, so we can do it. The diaspora can be enormously impactful. And it should push for, for the right to vote. The diaspora today contributes more money to Nigeria than crude oil. You, you, you see the numbers on diaspora remittances. Why shouldn't the diaspora use that leverage to determine how Nigeria travels? It's a matter of organization. If you organize... You can make sure that we don't agonize and progress can be made in Nigeria. Thank you. You're yeah, muted. Sorry about that. I was hoping we'll have time for a more interactive session, but time is fast spent. You're also tired. Yeah, and some of our members have meetings here and there. Some could not join. I've been getting a lot of apologies. So uh, let me call on Son to do a vote of thanks. Uh, I'm sure we have all bought in directly or indirectly into the new tribe. I will send everything you've sent to me to everybody. And uh, maybe we even add you to our Discord group, you know, so that you can see some of the things you have been doing and all that. I we always love to learn from you. We're a small tribe already, but we are all of like minds. And, uh, you know, <laughs> yeah. So uh, is Mr. Luajibade still there? Are you still there? 
I'm here. Okay. Can Hello? you do us the vote of thanks for Prof and uh, so that we can call it a day? Prof, thank you once more for your time and everything you have done and sacrifices. I mean, to everyone here, we say thank you. To a better Nigeria, we say thank you. And we pray that every effort we, we put into this will turn out to be fruitful, positively. And all will be well. Long life, Nigeria. And God bless everyone. Thank you, bro. Thank you so much. So you have a uh, good one. Enjoy the weekend. Thank you, everybody. Yeah, Shiju is uh, she's in the uh, Conservative Party, so they are campaigning now. The election is coming, so yeah, sure. Yeah, she's very, very, very busy, and she's hoping that she'll be nominated as a Conservative uh, candidate also. So I'm sure they have uh, a lot. Uh, yeah. Is that why we didn't we didn't get to hear her speak? Uh, yeah, yeah. So I've been chatting with her, and uh, she's uh, she's a two time councillor, but she's hoping to be a nominee for the Conservative Party right now. So. Okay. Let's keep okay. fingers crossed for her. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so from my neighbor party, bit. she crossed over to conservative, but she's uh, she, she's 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 a quality man. All right, thank you everybody. Thanks, uh, Prof. Thanks, thanks, Peter. Thank yeah, you. Thank you, you. Thank you Professor. Thank you. thank you all so uh, much. Thank you, Maria David. Thank Great you. weekend. Thank you. Oh. I know you can hear us. you went in and out also. Hopefully mm -hmm. next time. Thank you, everybody. See you all. Hopefully, we we'll get Dr. Fire Me next time. I will put him at the center. He won't escape us. <laughs> all right. Yeah. Bye. Bye. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye.